Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. We're just going to give folks a little bit more time to log in um, before we start the discussion. Okay. I assume that everyone read the book because it's a book discussion. There's going to be spoilers. So I don't want to hear it later on that, oh my God, I didn't know this happened in the book because we're going to talk about it. So um, give me a few minutes and we're still waiting for a good amount of people and um, we'll start then. Gotta unmute myself. Hi everyone, thank you for being here today. We're so excited. I have about a month since I read the book and I've been dying to talk about it. <laughs> and I know that is a sentiment for many of you here. So um, this Dominican Readers Book Club is, sorry, I live in the Heights and there's motorcycles everywhere. So um, I'm the, my name is Angela, Angela Abreu, people call me Angie, and I am the founder and creative director of Dominican Writers Association. And as part of Dominican Writers Association, we have the Dominican Readers Book Club, where we encourage folks to read books written by Dominican writers, and mostly creative writers. So um, I don't get too much into academia because that's not the world that I navigate in. Um, I'm a creative writer myself, so we publish and promote and um, the works of just Dominican writers, mainly in the diaspora. Um, so this um, book club discussion today is in part with Latins Read 2, Mates and Giselle. Ladies, if you're here, wave your hand. <laughs> And I ask that folks, please mute yourself if you're not um, speaking. 
Um, and also the Mami Chula Social Club. Cl Claudia, unfortunately, had something come up at the last minute and she's unable to join us, but she was, you know, encouraging everyone to um, come join and discuss the book with you all. So um, just a few things. I'm not facilitating the discussion. Um, Marilyn Ramirez will be facilitating the discussion on my behalf. Um, and just to let you ladies know, if you, we don't want like everyone to talk at the same time. So if you use the participant box at the bottom of the screen and just raise your hand, we'll be able to call on people to, I guess that would be good, right, Marilyn? Call on people and they could interject and um, share their opinion, ask questions or whatnot. Um, Marilyn has some good 18 questions, but I don't think we're going to get through all the questions today <laughs> um, because she really worked on, on, on that text. So Marilyn, take it away. Introduce yourself. Let these ladies know who you are. Um, and let's get started. Okay. Thank you so much, Angie, for giving me this opportunity um, to facilitate this, uh, this book club. Um, my name is Marilyn Ramirez. I am from Inwood, also known as Dykeman. Um, I had moved to the Bronx uh, for seven years and I just moved back to, to my neighborhood. So I'm still trying to unpack. Um, I'm also a high school teacher at um, the High School for Media and Communications. That's one of the schools in G-Dubs. So um, reading these stories is really close to my heart because it resonates um, not only with my upbringing, but also with my students. Um, and okay, so that's enough about me. Uh, I want to get everybody involved initially. So I just want you to drop in the chat box. Uh, what was your initial reaction um, after reading Clap When You Land? So just take, I'll give you guys like 30 seconds and then I'll read some of them out. Or I'll have, I'll have a volunteer read them out. I'll read them, Marilyn. Okay. Among them, shocked, straight to tears, what a body of work, loved, um, and I don't usually read YA, I loved every word. Oh my God, I need a part two. Can we get a sequel with Elizabeth? Loved it, loved it, loved it. I want more. I didn't want it to end. So well written, amazing verse, beautiful work of art, anticipation for the sequel. So good, so shocking, nice descriptions. The mujeres in this story are powerful. It gave me all the feels. So accurate in terms of depiction of grief, spirituality, and the depths of the family relationships. I want to know what happens next. Definitely want more of Jahaira and Camino, poetic and beautiful, a page turner, so much complexity presented so well. Her writing was so vivid. All right, thank you. Wow, so I can Nothing see- Nothing negative about this book. I know, there's a lot of passion in there. <laughs> All right, so um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna jump right in. So I do have uh, many questions here, but um, as Angie said earlier, we're not gonna get um, to do them all. So uh, I'm gonna like jump around and just try to pick out some of the ones that will probably lead to bigger conversations. So um, thinking about the structure of the book and the two narrators, what did Acevedo do for the reader by going back and forth between Sosua and New York City? Um, yes, I can also post them. Let me bring up the document so I can copy and paste. So if anybody, um, Angie, are you handling that, um, the, the box where, because you have that, right? Handling what? When the people, when somebody wants to respond, you have the response box, because I don't see that. Oh, the, you mean the, the, it's through the participants, isn't it? In they, the raise their, they raise their hand, and I oh, see okay. it on the participant box. Okay. Like, Kendall, Kalenda, Allen, James just raised her hand. You have a question, Kalenda? You can unmute yourself. Yeah, I was just going to say to answer the question, having the two narrators help converge the timelines. And it also gave like two 
perspectives on a on the similar event and by having the two narrators it did create suspense okay so i just oh no i didn't do that okay so you said that it created suspense um let's go into what type of suspense so we'll go into the the story right because this um the father uh was was killed in that um in flight 587 and um the first part of the story really takes us through um those different perspectives um in camino's perspective and jahida's pers perspective so does anybody want to talk a little bit and we can get into a little bit of, of the characters who so we can take, uh, let's take Jahida first. So we want to talk a little bit about her, um, her qualities, her personality traits and um, what type of life she was living in, in, um, in New York. Um, okay, Giselle? So I wanted to say to, uh, with regards to the last question, that one of the things that going back and forth sort of did well was not only give that differing perspective of the same event, but also, I don't know about any of y'all, but eventually I started to like hear two different voices in my head without even really needing to um, go back and see who was talking um, because it, created such an individual personality for each of the girls. And, um, you know, with Jahaira, she's sort of in New York City, living this life um, of like a girl that has the secret, right, uh, that she found about her father and sort of how she's dealing with um, keeping that secret and also balancing like her relationship and like school and, um, she kind of seemed more of like the laid back sister to me. Camino sort of seemed like the determined one. So. Okay, somebody want somebody else want to add to to what just Salt just said? Mm. Marilyn, do you mind posting the question in the chat box also? Because I think some sure. people may be missing, or you might want to repeat the question. You ready, babe? So I posted the first one, right? Did I post it or no? Why isn't it coming up for me? Is that coming up for you guys or no? No. In the chat, you're typing something? Yeah. I'm copying and pasting it in there and it's going through, but no. then I don't, don't worry about it. Just repeat the question. All right. So should I repeat the first question again or the second one? The second one. Okay. So, um, so we talked about the, the, um, the way the book is structured, right? Where it goes between Sosua and New York city and there's two narrators. And then now we're talking about, we're comparing and contrasting Camino and Jahaira and how um, like their personality traits and their qualities. And um, no. we can also discuss how are their lives different and how are Hi, they- Hi, can I speak with Isabel? Hello. Who's that, Cindy? Cindy, you wanna say something? I don't know. Karina has her hand up. You can unmute yourself, Karina. Um, yeah, I was in my, like, I also started hearing two very distinct voices in my head. And like, I've read other of um, Acevedo's work before and Camino sounded like a Liz Acevedo's character initially, like instantly. Like I felt like I was like, oh, I know this, the, the like rhythm in her words, right? Like the, the flow of the language that was used was very familiar, while Jahaira was more like a reserved character. Like it took a little while to like, I, re I like recognized as the New York City, the New York Dominican story right away, but still felt like she was like an onion. Like she was just more close, she kept, she kept the story closer to her heart. And it took a while to, for us to like really get to know her deeper thoughts. While Camino, I feel like from the beginning was like, this is like, she had everything 
more open and more like out there and like her story just came to me close uh, easier um but i appreciated you know like i think from the beginning just there is this idea of like one foot in each place right and like even though neither of the girls had sp spent any time in the other one's world they still felt that like connection that that pull to the other side of the of the of the atlantic right like on the other side of the water um and having them come back to back but then eventually the last section it being both of them together um i could i didn't need to know who was talking like i as soon as i started the page i was like oh this is camino and like as soon as i, ended, I was like oh now it's jahaira and like i was able i didn't need the the different chapter titles so yeah okay thank you for that does anybody else want to add to what Karina just said? I, I can see that Jennifer has her hand raised. How come I can't see all this stuff? Click the participant box on the bottom and then you can see next to each person's name like the little hand go up. Yeah, Jennifer. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I, I have also read um, Elizabeth's prior work, and I, I actually think um, Jahaira is a lot like Xiomara to me from Poet X. Um, they have a lot going on like internally, and there's sort of this like competitive nature to them as well. Um, but I think I agree with what everybody said that the voices are really distinct and I thought it was so beautiful when like both of the stories kind of converge and it sort of becomes like the same poem. Um, that was kind of like the climax for me in a way. So, yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Anyone else? Tanta gente aquí. Nadie tiene nada más que decir. Sharon. Sharon. Go ahead, Sharon. <laughs> I'm trying to unmute myself. So for me, um, what I loved about the two different voices was like I found myself like rooting for each girl. So it's like as I, I would root for one, and then I'm like, this one's my favorite, and then the other one was my favorite, and then like when the story's like came together I think like that was like that beautiful moment of like especially like their initial reaction like to each other because they each had this like preconceived notion of like what it was going to be like or who the other person was like and it was just like beautiful because up until this point it was like you're rooting for two different people okay thank you Sharon um, all right, so we're going to get a little bit more into um, some of the other details, but let's just go back for a minute and talk about the setting. So in New York City, it's Morningside Heights, and in, so in Dominican Republic, it's Sosua. Um, why do you think that Acevedo chose those, um, like those neighborhoods specifically, specifically the neighborhood of Morning Morningside Heights in New York City? and the town of Sosua in the Dominican Republic. And what effect does, does the setting have in... Um... Go ahead, Paola. Hey, everyone. Um, I think it was interesting for her to choose Sosua as the story un like unfolded. It was pretty obvious because of the, the big sex tourism in that area specifically. It's like, you know, I feel like a lot of people in the last... 15 or 10 years have thought of like DR and Punta Cana, but those that have been traveling the tourism that really started in the 80s towards Dominican Republic was really centered in the Sosua area. So I think that that like laid the groundwork for that storyline. And then for Morningside, I thought that was interesting because I feel like, you know, it was easy to be like, oh, Washington Heights, right? Or like Inwood, Dykeman, the Bronx. But I feel like she was able to as Liz does is like always kind of like throw a little curveball and she is such a lover of New York that she also wants to represent Dominicans that are in other places of New York like mm -hmm. there's a huge Dominican population in Brooklyn it's not something that we always associate with Dominicans right so I think that she was just widening that not only for the her Dominican audience but now because Liz has such a wider audience she probably also thought about like okay, cool, like, let me let all these new readers, these non-Dominican readers 
understand that Dominicans are all over the, the city and all over, I mean, everywhere, honestly. Um, so yeah. Liz was raised in Morningside Heights. Oh, see, I didn't even know that. So that's, <laughs> that's probably an so omen. That was, that was my thing. And I said, okay, she finally um, put the character where she was raised. Um, Giselle, you can unmute yourself. I also uh, was hella hyped that she put it in Morningside because I was raised in Morningside Heights. Um, and I think that it also added to like the, for me, knowing these two places intimately, um, it added like depth to the character without her telling us too much because you knew like what their outside sort of looked like, you know? So um, as Paola mentioned, you know, like there are Dominicans everywhere around New York City. So I think it, it was interesting because um, when I was seeing, when I was reading this book, I was also seeing it in my head. So I put Jahaira in like my project building where I grew up. And then I thought it was really interesting to have it in Sosua because I think that um, like Camino needed that lasso to her dad especially after the flight went down for her to be able to connect. Um, so, you know, that also added a, a layer to her because when I think of Sosua, like I think of my grandma's little house, right? So like throughout the entire book, Camino lived in my grandma's house in my mind, you know? Okay. Um, so ladies, I think it's mostly ladies out here, right? Yeah. Be shy. Like we want to hear from everybody, and it's and it. I'm. I'm. Thank you, those of you that are participating. But don't be shy. Speak up. Like there's no. There's no right. I feel like a teacher now. There's no right or wrong answers. You know, all all perspectives are appreciated. You might have something that you that you noticed in the book, and that we did it, and you could shed light on us. So don't be shy. I think people are mostly trying to be cordial since we're doing the raise your hand thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, but it's the, only the same people that are raising their hands. Okay, let's, rem let's remove the raise your hand. Let's see if that changes things. <laughs> well, we have Jennifer and we have Marilyn. Marilyn, yeah, Marilyn and Jennifer. Okay. Go ahead, ladies. Well, I thought it was super interesting. I mean, I thought it made sense that you brought up the whole sex tourism thing. And I can't remember the guy's name who's always like creeping on. on El Cero. El Cero. That, that was like one of the most visceral things for me in the whole story because one, like the fact that she didn't tell anyone until that moment where everything went south. Like the whole time I was like, wait, why does she tell her aunt? You know, like they have a trusting relationship. Like why doesn't she feel like she can express that this guy is following her and like that made me think about all the ways that like you know there's all these stereotypes of dominican women in the dr and especially young women being like um what's the word chapeadoras and things like that and like you know like your aunts over here are talking about all the chapeadoras in the dr and i'm always fighting with them because i'm like guys remember these are like children who are being pursued by these older really creepy dudes and there's sort of this disconnect like there's always people are always able to sort of put their responsibility on children basically for attracting male attention um so that was like one of the things that the whole time I was like why why isn't she able to just like say this is happening to me and it's weird and it makes me feel unsafe yeah maybe she felt that her that her what her it was her aunt right wasn't going to be able to do anything because her father was the one that used to protect her by giving him money. And she knows now we don't have any money to give this guy to protect us. He's not going to listen to my aunt. He's going to listen to cash. Mm -hmm. And since that's gone, you know, she just needs to figure it out. Who else? Right. Marilyn. Uh, Marilyn. I have a little list going on now. So we have Marilyn next. Marilyn, then Siley, and then Gabriela. Okay, so thanks for having me. And um, full disclosure, I don't know, I feel like sharing this. I'm not Dominican, but I'm a daughter right. of immigrants. <laughs> and I really connected with the dual storyline because I feel that even though Yahaira and Camino are sisters, that by having, you know, one be from the U.S. and have having one be, you know, um, from the DR, like it kind of reminded me of like, 
how me and my mom view things so different. And I used to always wonder like, why, why do you view it so different? Why, you know, why didn't you pursue your education? Why didn't you do all these things you wanted to do? And so hearing Camino's story and all the limitations she had, even though she was passionate, even though she was like um, smart and intelligent and so capable, like, and even though like, again, they're the same age, just the fact that they're in two different places, like changes it so dramatically in their perspectives and you know, what their like life, options are so I really appreciated that dual story um you know personally for that reason okay thank you for sharing that Marilyn um let's get Sidley hi um so I'm also not Dominican <laughs> so I didn't know the history behind Sosua and that thinking back now like if I would have known that I would have thought that Exero was much creepier than I initially thought he was. Because yes. initially I thought, okay, yeah, he's getting money to not be with um, um, Camino, but I thought there was more to the story. And then when I didn't get that at the end, it just felt off from what I was initially expecting from him. Because I thought there was something else going on that's not with the, you know, the sex trafficking or the sex tourism. So adding that to the story just adds more to it than I didn't know about. And it also just also, um, like what everybody's saying, the, what the two girls want is drastically different. I think that stems a lot from where they're at. So Jaida doesn't really have to worry about her education or anything because she's already here. And then Camino, she really wants it because she's over there and she wants to be a doctor. And being over there, she doesn't have that many options. So seeing the US is her gateway to to her dreams. So that was an interesting part of the, of the book. Okay, thank you, Sally. Um, this, uh, Gabriela. Hi, um, can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, so I kind of wanted to speak to the location. I actually um, also spent a month in Sosua the year before Elizabeth apparently visited to work at the same organization, Mariposa. And um, I'm a screenwriter and it's interesting because I'm also writing a story that takes place there about the sex tourism industry and how striking it is when just its presence and the, with that character, um, Cero, uh, how men like that exist, but what's even more striking is the women and kind of their own, um, their presence and I, yeah, I found that really important and I also like the location of Sosua being on the North Coast to me was really important because the water was such a conduit and like connection for Camino to her father and swimming was so important and water as a theme and the fact that of course New York and where the crash took place was right off of the coast. So I mean, as opposed to being in Bonao or somewhere in the center of the country, um, that was really important. So both of these places were places my mother also grew up in the projects in um, Morningside Heights. So these two worlds are ones that I was very familiar with. And um, I found it really striking the like connection to the water and what that carried through the generations and her connection with her father. And that geographically made a lot of sense to me in that way too. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, like what you what you said about the water and how um, how um, Camino really connected, right? And like that was her like sort of like her connection to her father, even after um, after he died. Um, Alessandra, Alessandra, are you still there? Yeah, sorry, I'm just moving outside. My son started oh, crying. It's okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, what I wanted to say, um, I feel like a, I really related with Camino a lot just because, um, I grew up Chicana in a very rural area and, um, very low income. And I feel like I wanted to just talk about, I, I don't know if any of you all related to this, but, um, not wanting to put stresses on our parents mm -hmm. and the people who take care of us. And, you know, like, okay, I can handle this, even though it's a situation that none of us should ever, ever, ever encounter. But these really big, big, serious hardships come into, um, especially women of color. And, you know, and it's like, they were talking about how beautiful Camino was. Um, 
you know, and when they get taken that young, it's just so sad, but I can un totally understand why she didn't want to put that on um, her aunt, just because we try to protect our elders, <laughs> even from a young age. So that's, that part hit me really hard. I was like, oh, I get you, girl. <laughs> It's like you have to grow up uh, ahead of time, right? And just and try to and hide things. Do make adult decisions and hide them from your parents. Thank you for that. Um, so, Calandra. Yes, and I would like to say, like the book highlighted the obviousness of El Cerro's predatory nature. But Yahira was abused on the train and she kept that to herself. Like, so sometimes people think because you have resources and things are going well on the outside and she's still getting good grades, that everything's okay. And there wasn't an outlet for either of these children to ask in detail what happened and even um like camino's aunt was like you know don't be fast like you know putting it on the child and that possibly could be because of town gossip misrepresenting what is happening um so definitely i felt neither of these children had true outlets to discuss their trauma. And even in the climactic scene at the end with all four women, they had to escalate it to the you know point of machete murder to get out of the situation. Like a no mean no was not going to work in that situation. Thank you for sharing that. And I mean, that, we, we see that all the time, right? That, hap that things like that happen in our community that, she'll, and somebody was just talking about that before, right? That, um, that, the, that the blame is placed on the victim. And even if it's a child, the, the, you know, they, the blame is still placed on that child. Or like, what did you do to, for that to happen? As opposed to like, no, that person took full advantage of that child, you know, and that child is innocent. Um, yeah, and you're right. Um, Yahida does get groped in the, in the train. Um, that actually resonated with me because I was groped once too, when I was about 16 on the train where this guy just grabbed my butt. That was like back in the eighties and we used to wear these Madonna skirts and it was like a really tight skirt. And so I guess my butt was just like popping out. Right. And he just went and he, and he grabbed my butt. But you know what I did? I turned around and I fucking punched him right in the stomach. <laughs> and I was walking with my mother. She was just like, what just happened? I was like, don't worry, mom. I just took care of it. So at least, even though I was very upset that he invaded my space, but I felt good. That did give me some, um, you know, some good feeling that I was able to, to get him back. But, you know, so I'm always telling my daughter to be careful with her space to be protective and to be aware of her surroundings. But sometimes you're, you're in, a, in a tight train and it's hard to be careful, right? Because there's people like right next to you. Um, let's hear from, I don't know, uh, Sally and Gabriela, you still have your hands up. Do you still, is that from before or are you like, you again? I think it's from before. Okay, so let's go with Tiffany. Hey everybody. Um... Just to kind of piggyback off of what you guys were talking about, um, I kind of found it weird that um, Camino's tia and her friend Carline both did not second guess what everybody was saying about her either. Um, and it kind of it kind of rubbed me the wrong way because I was like, not once did they kind of second guess what they were hearing from the neighborhood people especially her best friend. If her best friend knows how she is and she's not that kind of a girl on a regular basis, um, I think that's what amplified the fact that, you know, they were placing it on her and not him. When everybody knows this is what he does on a regular basis. So it kind of upset me that they didn't even give it a second thought. So It's the, it's the culture in DR um, where even women... 
um, how do I say that the, the misogyny, yeah. even women push it. Right. So it doesn't, we teach our men how to be misogynistic. Mm -hmm. Right. And we pass that on from generation to generation. And even though it's wrong, the women in DR are always going to be questioned. That's just the culture of, you know, in machismo um, in our country. Uh, just wanted to jump in and kind of um, say something after Tiffany. I agree that like it upset me, but I think that's what made this book so real because had that, you know, had her aunt and um, Yahaira's mom came, you know, came in and responded how we want them to respond, it would have taken away from what actually happens because 99% of the time, unfortunately, it's how we've been saying, you know, the burdens on us, the burdens on the victims. So it did bug me too, but I appreciated how real Elizabeth kept the whole story. You know, she didn't sugarcoat right. anything basically. So I, I, I appreciated it that even though it bugged me. No Disney world in there, right? She really did keep it real. Um, so, oh, Chantal? Yeah, I just, I wanted to say that um, one of the things for me reading the book, it was that I could differentiate the two, Camino and Yahaira, by their relationship with their dad. Like, I know that was very prominent in the story, but it's just, I feel like with Yahaira having both parents at home, she being closed off is because she assumed they should know things about her because they lived with her every day. And with Camino, since she only saw her dad three, you know, for three months in one year, everything was so open with her because she wanted everyone to know how she was in a sense because she only had the one parent and she only saw him once a year versus Yahira kind of felt like, you know, even in the book, she doesn't outright said that she, she says in, in the book that she didn't tell her mother that, you know, the neighbor was her girlfriend. Her mother kind of just knew. And, and she, and her dad never asked and she didn't think her dad knew, but it's because he didn't care. He never assumed so. And I think it was just that, like, that was what made them so, so different in a sense that it was, since Yahira was with him for so long, for like, you know, throughout the whole year, she kind of felt that like he should just know things about me and he should just I don't need to tell him versus Camino having to like catch him up every time she saw him. Thank you for that. Um Marilyn? Miss Marilyn. Marilyn or Karina? Oh, I already made my comment. Thank you though. Okay. Um, all right. So in the interest, because we only have like 15 more minutes and we haven't even like touched the surface, right? Like we started talking, but um, I want to, because I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about the Tia. And then um, we talked about El Cerro already. We're not going to give him that much more time. But then I want to get into just, um, I made like a little list of the themes. So I just want to like maybe touch on the themes a little bit and get some of your perspective on how she develops those themes. So um, let's talk about Thea. Um, how is she depicted? Thea Solana. And um, do her attributes symbolize Dominican women? And also, um, how does she help Camino define her purpose in life? So if anybody, um, anybody want to chime in about Tia? I felt Tia represented like endurance. Um, she represented like hope you know, don't give up on your patience, you know, never speak negativity. There's always a chance. Um, so I definitely, you know, she pursued it like motherliness. She came off definitely asexual. They didn't really describe her beauty in any way. Um, so I definitely felt like she was like a hopeful. She was also like, um, a community connector with people coming to her for prayers and healings and she was also with the prayers and healings 
part of the traditional ways that some people had moved away from unless they were desperate. Somebody else want to chime in? Uh, it was you. Oh. Okay. Let's get, we're going to get back to you, Chanta. Let me get you, you keep, I'm sorry. You, 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 did I say that right? If not, correct me. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, this is Yubi. I think the aunt was at least a great representation of what the Dominican women that I have had in my life are. They, I mean, her aunt to me represented strength, nurturing, caring, constantly giving. Um, I was blown away by her tenacity and and her strength even at the airport when she was saying goodbye to Camino and she didn't shed a tear when inside you knew that her world was crumbling. Like this was the girl that she raised, the girl that she loved, the girl that she nurtured and, and was there for. I'm, I mean, I, I get goosebumps talking about it. I can only picture how this entire time she's probably thinking of how different her life and how empty her life was going to be without Camino, but she held it all in. Because as, as far as my mom, as Dominican women, we, we are taught to just do, give, love, and not, we're never told that our cup has to be full. Mm -hmm. It's always you just give, you do, you do, and you do until you can't do anymore. Mm -hmm. And she represented that for me. Thank you. Chantal, do you want to add something to that? Oh, no, I just wanted to say that, at least for me, I don't know for everyone else, um, it was interesting that she never told Camino that she had a sister. Um, I felt like, you know, I'm Dominican, but I, I'm from the capital of JR, and I feel like a lot of the people that I come across, right, even my own family, that is something that they would have talked about. And well, she, least, like, not me, right? Yeah, like when she emailed, like hush, hush, and the kid would like listen from the other room. And so it was very surprising to me. And like, it, it showed a lot of strength from the, um, from the Thea and just how great of a person she was that she just never let out that secret to Camino all those years. Um, and she never said anything about like, oh no, because your dad has another family or anything else like that. Um, so yeah, that was interesting to, to read. I just want to add to that. Sorry, I, I didn't raise my hand, but that's okay. Go ahead, Paula. I wanted to add to that because I thought I thought the same thing, but then I was like, I looked at the bigger picture of the story and like just the bigger like the overall themes, and I don't want to jump ahead, but like in this book, there's so much um, all the complexity of like the Dominican family dynamic mm -hmm. is so, and not even only Dominican. I know the Dominican family construct is very complicated. Um, and she sheds light on this. So I feel like the, the way, like in order to make that valid throughout the whole book, I feel like she had to make the aunt, the aunt like not speak on that to, to Camino on her own, you know? Cause like it, it just adds more to the fact that there is some level of toxicity, there is complexity and there, and that that's like, I'm sure a lot of us in one way or another can relate to like the complexity um, of the, the Dominican family construct. And I don't even want to say Dominican, it's literally in the Black and Latin community. And also, I mean, because Tia is, she's the, like the town curandera, right? She's the paltera. She goes to tend to the woman that, that has cancer. So she's like the town doctor. And then what is Camino's chosen field for a career? is to be a medical doctor. So I found that it was very interesting how Acevedo sort of, you know, this like old world view or, or not view, but like tradition of healing. And then um, she sort of passed that down because um, Camino was her apprentice, right? So she's sort of like passing that down to Camino, but then Camino is gonna become a medical doctor at hopefully Columbia University, right? Um, so we only have a few more minutes before Angie comes and interrupts us. So I, I wish we can, I wish we had like three more hours to talk about this book. So, um, Paul just started us off on some of the, the themes. So, and some of you said other things that I didn't think about. So, so I'm just going to read like some of the themes that sort of came up for me, um, home and leaving sex tourism, um, lesbian or gay lifestyle or not lifestyle just gay um lesbian i said um grief 
remesas, right? Because we are, people in DR depend a lot on remesas, immigration, identity, intergenerational relationships, and Dominican and Haitian relationships. Um, I don't know, like, you guys can drop some, some thoughts in the chat because we're not going to have time for everybody to chime in. But if everybody, anybody has something that they really want to get out, and now I'm seeing a lot of hands there. So let me pick somebody that hasn't spoken yet. Um, I'm going to go with Lisa and then Bres Bresnev. Go ahead, Lisa. Hi. Um, I Hi. feel, I was putting that in the chat, actually. I feel, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was um, insinuated or mentioned that the uncle that the tia knew the dad since he was little, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. So I feel that the tia um, was being loyal to him by not um, telling his secret, by not divulging to, to the to Camino, that there's this whole other family, that there's this whole other life he has um, in New York out of um, loyalty to him and to knowing him since he was little. I think that's where I'm getting at. I don't know if anyone else feels the same way. You're probably touching on one of the themes there of loyalty, right? Interesting. Um, and I also want, with the layer of immigration, um, children think they know everything and why everything's done, but when you add the complications of immigration, needing marriage certificates for proof, um, needing certain people to sign, like this heritage and background information when it's unknown makes the story incomplete and it makes it more understandable when you understand that there are like legal forces forcing issues. Okay. Thank you. Um, Eileen, let me get Eileen. You haven't spoken yet. Go ahead, Eileen. I was just wondering if anybody else um, was thinking about like the way that the book was written, like um, the line breaks and all the spaces. I just wondered if, I see a lot of head nods. <laughs> I was wondering if it was just me. So I just wanted to know if anybody, you know, if you had any questions on that, Mari Ling or anything like that. But to me, it just like, I was wondering if it was intentional or not. Um, does anybody want to, because she, I think, she, did she talk about that? Or somebody, somebody has talked about that, right? Like when, when something gets really heavy, um, it's sort of to give the, the reader like a little break, right? Like sort of like, so you can process what you're reading because it's like too much. And she did that at times. And at times she had like big gaps, right? There was actually one, one piece that I really, really enjoyed where it was like this conversation between um, Jahaira and Camino. And there was like weird, right? Like the spacing and then one is up here, one is down there. But I think she really played, she's like very experimental, right? Because... I've seen, I've seen breaks in, in reading, but the way she did it is like, she took it to another level, right? Like the way, like her, like the way she did it, it wasn't just spacing, but like the angles and stuff too. Yeah. Okay, hold on guys, cause there's um, a few other people who have questions. Let's um, have Lizzie. Hi folks. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Acevedo and I just jumped in. I, Angie invited me to join you all, but I didn't want to interrupt your conversation or some questions you might have, or I think that these should always be deliberately about readers and sometimes authors get in their feelings. So I jumped in near the end and kind of heard a couple of your questions. And um, I just want to thank you all for spending time with this novel and thoroughly investigating all the different things I was attempting. Um, I love the rundown of the themes because I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Like I was over here trying to jam pack this book. And so it's, um, I think there's a lot that I was trying to tease out and some things I couldn't fully pull through the whole story, but I wanted to touch on. And then there were themes that were big for me. And I appreciate the question on craft, right? What does a line break do? How can it be a pause? How can it be a moment to like pay attention to this word, pay attention to this rhyme or um, 
you know, I think line breaks are, are very personal, but I always try to end on really strong words. That was like the only question I let myself listen to because I knew I wouldn't be offended. <laughs> but um, I, I don't know. I don't know if there was something that kept coming up that I might have missed that you're like, no, the author needs to answer. I'd be happy to um, maybe one big question, Marilene, if there was one that came up or that you might have had while you were guiding the discussion. But mostly I, I just wanted to say hi and, and thank you all. Thank you, Liz. You know, some people are on here like, where's the sequel? When is the sequel coming? <laughs> <laughs> they have questions. They're waiting for part two. Could you let them know if you're going to have part two or not? I get this a lot for all of my stories. I think I end a book just shy of folks feeling um, like they got the whole story. And that's on purpose, right? Like I... I don't ever want to wrap something up so neatly that there's not room for possibility. And particularly because I'm writing stories that could go in many different directions. I want readers to be able to bring their own um, understandings and perspectives and kind of imagine these futures, right? Does Camino go and study medical, you know, in, at Columbia and then come back, right? Because she does love DR, she does love her Thea, and she very clearly at the end is like, this is not the last time. Does Yahira finally figure out what her path is? What does it look like to split that money? It didn't feel like it was for me to answer. My story was, can I bring these two young women together who, who have everything in the way for them to really learn how to love and support each other? And once I did that, the story for me is done. And similar with the poet X, can I bring this daughter to find her voice and be able to stand up for her womanhood with her mother? And once I did that, the story was over. And so I think sequels, unless there is a reason, uh, um, a narrative question that I have and a thing I'm trying to explore in attention, I don't know that there's another book there. So I'm, I love fan fiction. If you all want to write it, let me know. Send me the it's link. So I'm with it. To answer everybody, um, why did you choose the name Camino? I knew a girl growing up, her mom was a Solanist on my block and um, she would come visit her mom on the weekends when she worked. And I always loved that name. And it was a name that we made fun of her for. But I remember being like, but that name is kind of dope though, right? Like, and, and when I was thinking of this character, it's important to note that the whole book was written in Yahira's voice. There was no Camino. I was having a conversation with Evie Zaboy, who's a Haitian author who wrote American Street. And I'm telling her about this story. And I'm like, I'm missing something. There's a texture or like the heart of the story, como que no ahí. And she's like, you need the other sibling. But I was nervous, right? Because I hadn't written from a perspective set in DR. I wanted to make sure I would get it right. I realized at that point, I didn't have all the information I needed to tell that part of the story. So it was going to delay the way this book was gonna manifest, but I, I took the three years to like figure out that other side. So Camino came in much later and Yahira clearly means light and it has, um, it's just a name I love. It's such a like name I knew, but Camino was more of a, what does it mean for this girl that is gonna have to figure out her path and it's not gonna be clear. And anyone who studied, you know, any type of Afro or indigenous religions knows that this idea of the passageway of paths, of clearing the path, of opening doorways, Elegua comes up a lot, mostly with the father, but I think there is a relationship with the daughter there of, can you clear the roads? And what does that look like, right? And she was kind of this thing that came forth for him that changed the course of his life. So I could see him sending that name, Ella El Camino, she's a new path for me. And so I, I kind of wanted to play with the legacies our parents give us. And that she's obsessed with light. Everywhere she looks, she's thinking about Dando a Luz. She's thinking about Yahira's name. She's thinking about, right? And yet she's the one who doesn't have a name that's kind of there. So she often feels like an outsider, but I think he gave her his own, her own kind of um, legacy that she doesn't see until the end. I don't know, I could go on and on because I'm always like the clearing and the beach, like those is about clearings. It's about can she, kind of part the waves can she part the road so i don't know i was playing with those metaphors. i think the the ladies are like super surprised that you joined us for one because the chat is going crazy i don't know oh, if i'm not even looking over there anymore i'm sorry okay. <laughs> they're um sharing things about the book there's someone who said that her mission is to get the book into the hands of young men Oh, that is her yeah. summer mission. There's, there's, there's one man here, just so I can. And I there's wanted one to, man here. I wanted to chime in, but I I, I can. 
<laughs> it was okay. a great book. Thank you. It was amazing. But I, I, I was hoping to, to, to check in because, uh, I mean, I, for one, it's, it's surprising that there's not more men in this chat. And, and that's kind of like a little disappointing. Um, I, I can't speak for all of them, um, but I was really moved by the story just in terms of like how, like, you know, I think you hit on all the parts of um, like all these parts of like uh, Dominican is right. Like brujeria, you, you hit like immigration, you hit like the, the all, and also the parts about like that are unspoken about, which is like this queer identity too. like all of these kind of, I, I think it was like so important to like talk about these things and like elevate them and normalize them. And, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to read it. I was, I, I read it because of my partner. We kind of had our own little, little book club. Uh, um, so, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. And, and I do hope that more men read it because it's, it's like, you know, so, so many men are like, I'll speak for myself, like mama's boys. And, and like this kind of like really heightens and, and elevates like the multi like facets of, of women, Dominican women I'll speak for. I, I appreciate that. I mean, if it makes you feel better, there's not a lot of men in the book either. So you are. No, <laughs> this no, is, no, this, this is, is great. It should be in some ways. <laughs> this, this is great because, I mean, it starts with this tragedy, right? But it kind of like puts him out of the picture, right? Yeah. Which is, which, I, and then the one thing that I came on late, and I apologize for that. The, the one thing that kind of stood out for me was El Cerro. And like I was, I was talking about with my partner. I was like, "Is he la el ojo malo? Like, is he is he gonna get in the way? Like, that's how I interpret it. Um, like his character, because like I just felt so fearful for this guy and what he could have potentially done yeah. to Camino. I was like, "Oh my you god!" You felt fearful. Imagine the women who like know that guy. Yes, I I know. I, I yes, I've heard stories, and it's no. unfortunate. But I'm with you, and I mean, I think that did you all manage to talk about gender or how like the not yet, when not you, yet. Okay. We didn't really get into um, talking about gender. You want to go ahead? Well, I'll just jump in real quick. Since we were talking about names, I'll say that sometimes people think el cero is like the zero, mm -hmm. but it's actually el calnicero. So I was trying to think through what does it mean to be someone who's in the business of flesh, oh, wow. right? And so, and then it had this double meaning of like what he, what does he contribute zero nothing right he is he is taking from the community but that is it was more of like when i was thinking of what is his what does he represent is is the meat market right and the way that it is that simplified for some folks this is just business it's not young women's lives right i was lucky enough to do work with the mariposa foundation a few years back and and it's why the book is based specifically in this region right in the sosua region because there is such a huge sex tourism, sex trafficking that happens there. And I was thinking with the book, like, what does it mean to have these four women, I'm thinking of the, the tia, the mom, and the two sisters, who are pretty much haunted by men. There are so many interactions with men that never end up on the page, that are just them reflecting on what it means for the ghost of men to have so much um, control. Right? Even when El Cero is not on the page, the reader is haunted by El Cero and what he could do. Right? And, and when he is on the page, we know what is possible. The father is never on the page, and yet he is overshadowing the whole book. So it was, it was a strange project to consider, can I talk about the dynamics between men and women and the ways that certain relationships with men can resonate so strongly in women's lives? And for them, it, it's very different. Right? without ever putting these dudes on the page. Even with Yahaira, her whole instance on the train, we hear about after the fact, and yet it is one of the reasons that she can't connect with her father. And so it was this like, what are the wounds that we are unable to heal because that other person doesn't know how to show up, right? And so we're healing with ourselves and we're healing with other women and we're figuring this out and doing the work for all of us because so often, um, particularly older men in our community who were raised and indoctrinated in certain ways, don't know how to show up and don't know how to do that work. And so there was, gender is, it was big, right? And like, and then I had to force myself, like what are the depictions of men in positive ways? Because I never want a single story either, right? That Dominican men are not just one particular way. So you have Don Mateo from next door, you have her uncle, but even her uncle kind of funny. I did hear that where someone was like, why didn't the uncle say something? I'm like, cause men be funny, right? Like how they, you gonna hold your own, your own brother down, right? Before you, before you hold down whatever woman in your life, potentially, 
even though he loves his daughter with, or his niece, he would never tell her what his, her father had done. So gender was a big, big shadow kind of over the book. Um, but I'll let y'all discuss that further. <laughs> So I don't, I don't want to hijack. I really just wanted to like pop in and wave. No, but thank you for, and, and you were just making me think of, uh, what's his name? Is it Don Miguelo? That guy? The, the, he's Mateo, always, yeah. That he's always like doing these um, lives, um, the carne. Oh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> I was just thinking about him, right? Because like, he's like, he has such a huge platform, but all he wants to do is get women on his, um, on his IG so they can twerk. And he's always putting that up, like, quiero carne, carne. So, Karina has a question. Go ahead, Karina. No, so, so someone mentioned earlier, like, the fact that, like, we teach our boys, right? Like, this Dominican culture, we teach our boys how to be machismo, like, machistas, right? And, like, how we, which is why, like, my goal is to get this. I literally, I just ordered five new copies, and I'm handing it to my, I teach, I also teach, um, and I'm handing it to my boys. Like, I literally have children that I'm like, yep, yeah, you're reading this book this summer. They don't even know. I'm dropping it off in their house. Um, but it's like the idea of boys need to see, like, boys need to stop. Like, we always said, like, we have to we teach our girls to, like, to take care of themselves, to protect, like, watch where they're at. I'm like, no, no, no. We need to teach our boys that, this, that, that girls are not things that they touch, right? Like, it's, why, why are we teaching the victims not to be victims instead of teaching the oppressors to stop oppressing, right? So, like, and it's not all boys. And, my, like, and, I, and I look at my boys, I'm like, I wish you would. And they're like, nah, miss. But I'm like, but you have to have these conversations, even if you don't do it, right? Like when you see your boys, at, like hollering at somebody on the street, be like, nah, like she's not, she's running, like she's not about you. Like, yeah. like you have to teach the boys how to do that, um, because the older men are not necessarily passing that down, right? And at some point, uh, like we, we have to have those tough conversations, or we don't have it because we don't have text to t discuss it with kids, yeah. right? And like I can, I can go in in a paragraph that where you talked about whether we, we zoom in on the grouping and, and, you know, people talk about what's available or not for school. I'm like, let's talk about that. When you see that, when you see, like, when you're in the train, are your eyes open? Like, do you realize that your friend, your girlfriend, she's always in the train looking at where the exits are and you don't have that? And I now notice that and keep having those conversations. And we have to talk to our boys about that the same way that we talk to our girls about all the other stuff. Not that we shouldn't do that, but we, we it's, a, it's both sides. If we're only addressing the problem from one aspect, we're never going to fix it. And I think, I think it, I, I hope it's helpful to have these texts because sometimes it's simply about the script. Young men learn scripts from older men in their lives. They watch them on the corner. They watch them on the building. They watch how they speak. They watch how they speak inside the house. They watch how their mothers don't speak or only speak in certain ways. Oh, no, dejalo quieto que está. He's just tired. But when your mother's tired, que nata dejando quieta ella, right? Like, it's those little things that kids learn. And so I think what I hope my books offer are just disruptions to the script, right? And if nothing else, here's the script that women are saying, or some women are saying, did you ever think about what it means to be in those shoes and then teaching men, young men, new scripts? And this book a little less because I didn't have any um, prominent young men in the book, but in my two previous books, I always make sure that the love interest, that the young men who are represented um, are talking about consent, are very open to conversation, are always checking in with the girls in their lives, are able to be soft, right? Because I wanna showcase the representation that sometimes boys don't see in books, that you are allowed to be this and it's desirable and it's what your partner needs and it's helpful to your community. Like I think they, um, that's important. And I'm so glad that you aren't all falling into the trap of like, it's a girl's book. Cause any books, oftentimes when, they have young women protagonists. Teachers are like, well, I can't give this to, to young men, which I think is silly. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that y'all are uh, using it as an anchor text, yes. <laughs> but I also think that to get back to one of the things that we talked about earlier, um, the fact that uh, El Cero was after Camino and you know her best friend and her tia didn't, um, you know, like question whether or not she was asking for that attention. I think, yes, we need to involve boys in this conversation, but also I think that like, we actually need to have these conversations with like young women coming mm -hmm. up. And, um, you know, as like a daughter of Dominican immigrants, like no one ever talked to me about anything that had to do about sex and sexuality and relationships. And, um, you know, like how I think, 
you know, someone mentioned earlier too that it's because that's the culture in Dominican Republic and how women just eat up the machismo and like continue to perpetrate it. But also like, I don't know, I feel like the whole community <laughs> needs a whole um, sort of fixing <laughs> around having these conversations with like young people, you know, boys, girls, everyone, because until until that doesn't happen, right? Like we'll continue to have like these gropings, we'll continue to have these creepy ass men, we'll continue to have, you know, men in the, how you mentioned, like in the business of flesh, right? And um, yeah, like I, I could also talk about that forever because like I'm going to be an OBGYN, right? And all I wanna do is talk about like sex with young women and um, all of that, so. I think, I, I think, yes, the boys, but also like really like the girls too. And like having those um, very open conversations. Yeah. And I think it's, a, it's on all fronts, right? Mm -hmm. It's boys, it's young women, but it's also our mothers. It's also our fathers. It's, I think it's intergenerational. It is yeah. an understanding of like, where do folks come from that they carry these ideas? Mm -hmm. And like, how do you think about what do we keep and what do we let go? Right. And whenever we're talking about any traditions, and I, I do think that the way that misogyny comes forward in Dominican culture is a tradition, right? This mm -hmm. was an inherited thing that's been going on for hundreds of years. And so it can be difficult to challenge that, but I think it's happening. And I would say, I think it's even happening in DR, right? Because sometimes we think like all progressiveness is in the states and then going back. But right. I think that there's a lot of work happening in DR to address some of these things. If you all don't follow Max Positivas on Instagram, M-A-X Positivas, mm -hmm. they've been doing a lot of conversations online, um, all in Spanish on Afro-indigeneity, but also their whole thing is like, how do we talk about masculinity in Dominican culture? And how do we reframe what that could look like? So I think that there are a lot of folks trying to figure out at every level, how do we keep having this conversation across ocean, right? And so I, yeah, we, we all, there's a lot of work. I, I mean, there's nothing else to say except there's a lot of work and whatever front somebody is doing a little bit of work like that, that we just got to do our little bit because there's nothing else. Mm -hmm. I would also- The boys and the girls and non-binary and our parents and our abuelos and, and the vecino de la cruzal de la calle, everybody yep. it and should. It's like talking about sex is the hardest thing in our community, right? So I think that maybe religion also plays uh, its, its role in that. I remember growing up um, and I mean, I lost my virginity, I was 14 years old. And I didn't, cause I didn't know any better, you know? And my mother, the only thing she would tell me was, no te deje tocar de aquí para abajo. You know what I'm saying? But like, I never had that conversation with mom. Like I never, you know, like that was, that was like unheard of. So now I have, I have my, uh, my teenage daughter and like, I'm, I have those conversations where she's like, mom, you're so weird. Like, why are you talking to me about that? And I'm like, because it's gonna come up and I want you to be ready. I want you to know that I'm here to support you and, to, and I want you to take care of yourself when the time comes, you know? But uh, just even people my age, I know that they don't talk about that with their, with their kids. My own students tell me that they, like, they'll talk to me about sex, but they said, I can't talk to that, about that with my, with my own mom. Yeah, yeah it's a re-education. And I think it's one of the reasons I'm thankful that my books are being translated in Spanish, right? Because I, I feel like it can offer opportunities for, for parents and kids potentially to read together and then discuss. And I feel like that could be really scary. But sometimes, like we were saying earlier, just having the text or I'm not talking about me having sex, I'm talking about this character having sex can take off a little bit of the pressure that perhaps certain parents feel. Like my mother never got the talk about sex. She doesn't know what that talk looks like. She tried her best, but she was like, well, maybe if I just don't say anything, she won't do anything, which like is a terrible way to approach sex talks with children, right? But I think it, would, it wasn't because she didn't want to do right by me. It was because she didn't know how, right? And so while all these kids are getting those sex books that their parents give them, and then, oh, hi, and so I'm blah, 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 like, she didn't have that. So I think it's why it's important to have um, these moments in the books that potentially kids can talk with their parents without it feeling like they're, they're getting a lecture for something they may or may not have done yet, but more, let's talk about this in theory and figure out what it means. And I, I hope that it's kind of a depressurized way to do that. But 
I don't know. I, you know, I, I hope, I hope we'll see. I'm so early in my career. People think I've been here for a while, but I'm like, I'm just getting books into, I'm just figuring out what it means to have things in the world. So I have got a lot of parents who have hit me up and said they've read their books with their daughters. And so it, I know that, that there's an impact there in how folks are talking, but I think we have a lot of work to do. And so I'm glad there are OBGYNs and teachers and educators and nonprofit workers and people shouting out curly hair because we need everyone to just be like in their little fields doing, doing it all. Okay. I don't want to keep y'all up for too much. And I know it's, it's a little bit late. So I just wanted to say that I appreciate you. I'm so thankful to have been here with you all. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the novel. I hope that you left with questions. If anybody is a writer in the room, like I hope you know we need your story. There's no singular story of Dominicanness. I am telling one sect, but I know that we need a lot of our voices. Cause I'm sure there are folks who read this and like my mom would never, or like my uncle's not like that, or my part of DR isn't like that. And, and I think that's why it's necessary for there to be more than one person trying to represent us because we're not a monolith. Even just looking at all these little screens, we're not a monolith. And so I hope that um, if you're a creative person, like you feel empowered and know that at least this audience of one is out here waiting. So thank you all for being amazing readers. And um, I appreciate you. And please stay thank safe. You, thank stay you. Safe. One more question, Liz. What yeah. hair products are you using? Oh, well, I'm glad you asked. So my shirt is from Miss Rizos. And it's yes, uh, I I have my own shirt and all of the um, Afro-Caribbean and indigenous yes. women who have held it down. And I'm actually using Botanica which is um, yes. Yes. also Dominican-owned, woman-owned um, Botanica products and Botanica with the K. And I'm using specifically the hair cream. I haven't used any of the other products, but the hair cream is pretty dope and it's not heavy. So it's just like you're putting something to kind of um, stop it from frizzing, but not, I don't know, I'm not out here trying to overstyle Thank myself you. these days. So it's just <laughs> para tener algo ahí, but her stuff is great. It smells good. Yes, it is. Um, support it is. Dominican. So... If you like the shirt, Miss Rizos. If you're looking for hair product, Botanica. And um, thank you for supporting the novel and the book. Queen. Thank you so much, Liz. Have a good evening. Yeah, for sure. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed that surprise. What an that was amazing. <laughs> you're always doing it up, Angie. You're always doing it up. You and Marty Ling, look at you. <laughs> Well, Marilyn kept saying, Angie's going to interrupt. We are, we are about to finish. I, I'm like, don't tell them that. <laughs> just, you know, just keep going. And she's going to pop in and they're going to notice her. <laughs> no, even though you told me before when I saw her, I was so surprised. <laughs> I just loved everyone's face. Like, all at once, everyone was like, <laughs> like that emoji all across the board. It was great. I was like, an hour? Why is Marilyn being so such a stickler about an hour? Like, we never have Zooms for an hour, ever. <laughs> And when she came on, I was like, she looks very familiar. She what? looks like Elizabeth because her name, she changed it, which was smart, which was smart. I was like, I know her. Well, not know her, but you know. I know. <laughs> I the same thing, too. And then I'm like, hmm, who is that? Lizzie Ace? Like, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> Especially when you're at, when you use Zoom for work and you're expected to, you know, have your full name. And you're like, who came on here with like a nickname? Oh. Right, right. <laughs> Marilyn, you could go on. So now that she, um, so she came in and she, I took some notes on what she said, right? So I think she dropped, for me at least, she dropped some gems um, in terms of uh, el cero, right? Like I didn't connect that it was a carnicero, so I thought that that was very interesting. Um, and also I liked what she said about, um, about Camino, how she was obsessed with light. What did you guys think about that? Um, you know, like her obsession with the light and like with, well, Camino means path, but, sorry guys, I'm still like trying to process Elizabeth, but anybody can chime in if you want. Well, or anything I noticed, guys feel. I noticed the, the light thing, cause I remember how she talked about the beach and then um, how, 
yeah, the beach. And then the way that she was kind of, I don't want to say obsessed, but the way she talked about women giving birth, she liked how she it was, you know, that loose, which is means to give birth and how that relates to the light. And then I, I can't remember exactly right now, but when she's alone with El Cero, the light is what kind of saves her because it's the car. It's what actually literally saves her. So I didn't notice the rep the repetition of, um, you know, the light and coming um, to her life. And then also just her name. I, I'm, I'm glad she kind of confirmed it for me, but I did notice how it's, you know, Camino means path. And right now she doesn't have a clear path as to her future, but that relates entirely to what she's going through in the novel. Yeah, I mean, I felt like she, like her path wasn't clear, but she does have a path. Like she knows, she knows what she wants. Whereas Jahida and somebody else talked about that before, maybe because Jahida is already, um, she's here in New York and she, you know, she pretty much, she has access to more. So she doesn't really think about like what it is that she wants. Whereas Camino, she needs to create a path right? She needs to like, sort of like have goals and do something with her life. Um, anything else or any, any of the um, other themes that we talked that we just mentioned, but um, we didn't really get into talking about. So, cause we have like, I had um, one thing for me that I wanted to mention or note was how mature they both were as young teenagers mm -hmm. um, and like how much perseverance they had, right? They were going through so much. They lost a father and they were living different lives, but being 17 or 18 years old, it really reminded me of what it is to be a first generation American, right? That at a very young age, you are expected to support and help your parents and to provide that to provide them with resources that they are not able to have, but to grow up at a very young age, mm -hmm. right? And so that was one thing that I certainly connected with. They were bold as hell. Yeah. Because <laughs> I cannot imagine myself getting on a flight to DR. Like, I, I believe it was like in the middle of the night or something like that. Especially and after your dad. And just like... Yeah. Yeah, especially after her dad yeah. died on a airplane. So I, I felt that was really bold of her. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to, to even talk to these people in customs, right? And, and convince them to let her get, to let her board by herself. Yeah. I just wanted to mention something about about the mom, because I know the story is about the two girls, but I um, I also um, resonated with the mom because as protectors, we hide a lot of things. Like she, this woman was harboring this secret. She hated this man, she loved him and she hated him at the same time. And I think that she got her, her strength and her voice back when he died. Now she's in control. Now she's gonna make the decisions. You know, but all this time, she, she, even when she got the news, she went into the room, she, she was like, she looked disheveled from what I can remember from the story. And then, then she like came alive and then, you know, cogió la renda, cogió, cogió el mando. And a lot of moms do that. A lot of moms keep secrets. A lot of moms stay, even though they're not happy. And we, we, that's, those are, it, it is complicated because you know she could have left him but then she didn't you know there's it's it's, it's it, it could go both ways and then you're a single mom so now you, but you want your family but now you have to hold on to this dark ugly lie yeah so yeah that also was something that i thought was like very important for me for for me as well especially like after having read dominicana too and sort of some of the themes of like staying when you don't, when you're not happy in a relationship. But also like one of the things that, that was crazy for me was that like uh, Camino and Jahaira's moms were, were friends. Yeah. You know, 
and like how no go ahead <laughs> and like how it was so crazy to me that they were like best friends and i even think that he met them both in the malecon at the same time while they were together which is like insane and then there was so much growth that happened because truthfully like with the mom when she ended up going to dr and you know she was kind of being all like stank and like not really wanting to be there with good reason i a little bit of me was like oh just like grow up already like this girl needs you but when the whole thing with amino happened and like she finally like stood up and was like you know you don't know who i am like i can you know just protecting her i think that was something that was at that point i was like full-fledged ugly crying face because that to me showed so much growth in her and like i agree that she got her voice back when he died um and could finally almost like let a little bit of that go um even in when she was like telling Camino about how she was scared to see how much she might have looked like her friend and all of these things like oh my god it's amazing how it took for him to die so that they could be a family together yes right Add on that i found it really interesting and i've noticed in other and other occasions how the mom also felt like Camino, like she had some type of like not hatred but some some pushback on Camino because it reminded him that he cheated on her. Like she was projecting that like negativity on Camino. And then at the end when everything happened, I, I love that she got the light and she was like, it, you're not, it's not your fault what happened. Like you're a child at the end of the day, this is not your fault. Like none of this happened, you, you never asked for this. And it was nice to see that the mom reacted and was like, you still need a life. Like, it's not your fault, everything that's happened between, you know, your father and my and your mother and stuff like that. And so she I, did all the behaviors with her, right? The mom was with her. And then I like the way um, Jahaira sort of like stepped back a little bit so that her mother can bond with her stepsister. I also thought it was kind of interesting how the mom, the mom felt like she had to give like pay her family for her shame in a weird way. So she felt like she had to give all of them money because all this whole time they've been keeping the secret and really it was only a secret for Yahida it seems and Camino and that everybody else was in on it too. So um, that part of it was really weird but also very familiar, <laughs> um, which yeah. Yeah, everybody started rolling in and had um, the, the hospital bills. Um, the one guy, I think it was the cousin, he wanted to buy his fiance a, a ring. And just everybody started coming out of the woodwork, right? Sometimes I, thought, I, like, I wish I could get the lot, I, I could win the lottery, but then if I win the lottery, I'm going to have like so many family members, the primo, segundo, el tercero, el quinto, everybody coming for their piece. Go ahead, Shadow. No, I just, I thought that was really interesting too, because at least growing up here in New York, um, a lot of the times I grew up that my family in DR was the ones that always estaban pidiendo and always wanted money and like your family here didn't want it. And it was really interesting that when she got the money or was expected to get the money, Camino's dad's side of the family never came out. Like his, his brother didn't ask for money. Um, and no one in like DR either asked Camino, I mean, Yahaira, um, and no one asked Camino, at least in DR, like about anything knowing that they were probably gonna get a settlement from the airline. But Yahaira's mom's side of the family all came out of nowhere kind of asking for money. And like even the people who like lived in New York, like they were all like just visiting now all of a sudden people that you wouldn't see for years. Um, and so kind of let like par like that kind of, I guess, flip that it was like the people here, not the people in DR asking for money. Hey, to piggyback on what Angie was saying, it's very interesting how in our culture, at least I could only speak for Dominican culture because that's how I grew up. We're taught to shrink ourselves. We're taught to not walk too sassy. We're taught to lower our skirt because we're provoking the men. Um, it's always our fault. Um, and we're shown to be the, the, the weaker one, to shrink ourselves. And at the end of the story, all the women are the powerful women. The mom goes to the Dominican Republic, follows Jahaira. Jahaira goes to get her sister. You know, I think everyone was so surprised that she got in a plane by herself 
It's her strength. Um, I think it's also the juxtaposition that Camino can't leave and Jahaira can pick up so quickly and can do that. Um, but at the end of the story, you know, Cero is really a zero. He, he's going to be there forever. That's going to be his life. He has nothing. Um, you know, Camino's going to have this new life. We don't know how it ends, um, but we know that she made it to the United States. Jahaira has a plan. The mom ha found her voice. So at the end of the story, all the women hold the power. In our culture, the women are the strong ones. We're the ones that keep it together, that are there when the shit hits the fan. Um, and I don't think that that was any mistake that she did that. That's right. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. What's your next question, Marilyn? Ya, ya terminamos las 18 preguntas. Well, let's, let's see. We're not going to do all 18, but we've gone through, we've, because some of them we collapsed, right? Because maybe we're not, and I want to give a shout out to, um, to, to Liana and to Eileen that, because we talked a little bit about the book and, and they, they, um, they threw in some questions too. So thank you. Um, I want to circle back to Green. Am I pronouncing your name correctly, Bresnet? I'm sorry. So yes, it's, it's, it's Brezhnev. Okay. So it's a Russian name and, you know, it's Dominican. But yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. You don't need to explain. <laughs> um, we're going to um, put the questions available on our website. So if you click on the book club, all the books that we've read, we've created questions for them and you could download them. Because, of course, you know, when a white person reads the book, they don't ask the same questions that we do. <laughs> right? That's right. No, that's right. That's right. Um, Latinos, we have our own set of questions to ask um, because it, it just resonates with us differently. But you'll be able to download the questions and host the book club maybe with your students or... Um, and if with, with, wants, with other men, hopefully. We'll yeah, see. other men as well. And if anyone wants... To, um, who was it? Who, who's the one that's collecting books for their students? Is it got Karina, I think it was? Yeah, I, I, bought, five, I bought five copies because I have five Karina, kids. Karina, if, if, hit me up later on Instagram because I could help you with that. Thank you, Angie. But go on, um, Marilyn. All right, so I want, so what time are we going? So, hasta que la gente se canse, parece. All right, so let me, uh, I'm just going to read this quote since we were talking about Jahaira's mom. And so on page 218, Jahaira's mom says she wished she stopped loving Yano a long time ago. Um, why do you think, um, even though she felt shame in both herself and her family, she couldn't move on when she learned? I think we kind of touched on that, but I just wanted to get a little bit deeper. Like, why did, why, and why do women stay? And why did Ana stay in, in Dominicana? Like, what, what is it about Dominican women made I'm, I'm saying Dominican because that's the culture that I know too but what is it about Dominican especially like old I think more old school Dominican right we are raised to take care of our family and to stay no matter what you that never leave you never leave you, you stay never leave. you put up si él te parió muchacho en la calle tú tienes que criarle ese muchacho that, that's, the, that's how we, our mothers were raised and then you look like the bad guy for because tú lo abandonaste. But also, I think that like you know, uh, um, I'm forgetting what was it that uh, Jahaira's mom did for a living. But also, there's like this concept of being like financially captive, right? And like not necessarily having enough money for yourself. And like you know, Camino's dad with his billiards and all of this other stuff, like seemed to be the one that was like providing for for Jahaira's family, but also for Camino and like the tia. So there's like this concept too. I mean, I ask myself this question all the time, but like in both books that you just mentioned, Marilyn, it's like, you know, not having enough to be able to like be on your own, even if you did want to leave. So you just kind of stay, you know? Has anyone else thought about the double standards in our culture? I am one, I have, I am one of four and I'm the only girl. And I was raised with, you know, the women cook, the women clean. If, you know, if my brothers had girlfriends, it was applauded. 
my mother to this day does not under I'm I'm 46 years old and to this day my mom does not understand the concept of a woman dating because what are neighbors gonna think when they see Tom pick you up on Monday and Dick pick you up on Tuesday you know but yeah you know my brothers had all these girlfriends and it was all good in the neighborhood and I think you know that that that's also a stigma that's like put upon us I, I mean I'm speaking for the Dominican culture because that's what I am and you know, I myself come from a father who was married with three children. And it's, you know, it's never frowned upon when the man makes multiple mistakes. But the minute that the woman decides that she doesn't want to be in a marriage that's not working for her, she's, you know, the, she's wearing the scarlet letter. But that's why it's condoned because it's like, ellos son así. Así but que ellos son. Sorry, yeah, it's, so it's like okay. boys will be boys so we come from that and it just keeps perpetuating you know as as we're all on the zoom so we we all, all read the book and we can all relate like i have a son who's 15 and i speak to him i tell him if i don't care if she's naked on the floor it's no you know like <laughs> we have to speak to them our parents didn't speak to us this way you know we had so it's incumbent upon us to change the narrative yeah, and, and I just want to add, it doesn't also, it, it doesn't fall on women, right? Like, I know that there's a lot of women here, and, and I'm not trying to speak for every man, right? Like, I, I think the, the, the conversation needs to be, like, men have to also be put on the hot seat. You know, I think a lot of women, like, like look, there's all women here, and there's, there's um, like, all of you are in one way related to, to men, whether that's, like, your brother, your son, you know? So, like, how, how do you use that, that platform that you have to kind of influence like the next generation, you know, like, I mean, I'm <clears throat> part of the work that I do, like I'm a therapist and, and part of the, the, my, my, what, one of the things that I'm trying to do, especially with everything that's happening now, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of creating a men's group because there's not a lot of places for men to, 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 to share feelings or to, to speak up about what's happening, like not, not only in their own culture, but also in society, like how many men of color have been murdered in the hands of police and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, we can't do this without the women. And um, I, I encourage the, the women to like, to push men as well, even though they, they're, they're, they're going to give you whatever a million and one stories, we need you in, in the fight for, for our survival, you know? Yeah. And I, just to piggy up, piggyback off of that, I think it's a double-edged sword because, you know, at the, at the same time that we say, uh, men like are, you know, los hombres son como los pejero, like, you know, they feast on the flesh because it's there and that's it. And, you know, at the same time, that's how you're treated by when you're in a space where all of a sudden los hombres son como los pejero means that you're being treated as less than a human being as well. Um, and, you know, it implies that you don't have control over yourself and your body, which no man should want that, I don't think. Um, I was just going to jump in, you know, part of parents, parents are training us for the framework that they know we live in, you know, so like some of the warnings were based on the facts of life, like my mama got a one bedroom project, me and my three kids are physically not going to fit if I wanted to go back home and leave. So therefore, she's preparing me, you got to work it out. I physically have no resources for you. You physically don't fit. Like, so I'm not giving you a path back home because there's not one. Um, and secondly, um, as women, when we reinforce that there's a queen bee and there's a virgin Mary, we are setting up our scarlet letter friends living their best lives to not reach out to us when they want to leave because we've already set up a framework that we not here for you. All right. Okay, guys. So um, just so that we can respect everybody's time and, um, you know, we're like, we're having a very rich conversation, but we're moving away a little bit from the book. I just want to bring it back one more time to the book and just talk about one of the themes that I think that um, is very close to my heart and um, the work that I do, and it's on the Dominican and Haitian relationship. Um, 
how do you how do you think that uh, that Acevedo explores that? Do you think that um, do you think it's it's in a positive light or is it too complex? But in what ways um, does she explore that theme of Dominican and Haitian relationships? It was wonderful that she had a Haitian girl be Camino's best friend. To, sh to just show that it's possible. And um, I think she went a little bit in, into explaining um, how they've been friends since little girls, right? Um, how, how their family um, coexists with one another. And I think that was, that was wonderful to not include any drama, to not include any, you know, she, she just said, and then I guess at some point you can't really tell that she's Haitian, but then you do later on. So I'm glad that she didn't say it up front. Um, and it was just because to Camino, you know, it's just a normal relationship. There's no difference between her and, um, and her best friend. I think also like Liz or Elizabeth had like, you know, I feel like as Dominican Americans, our response to the Dominican Haitian um, situation crisis is very different than than people that are on the island born and raised there because we have a certain i guess like access to a certain level of privilege and education right and like i think it was bold of her to introduce it and i think that it, it's like her in her way as an author to take a, a political stance right without being so forthcoming about it um in a way where it will open up it will open up for people to like attack her. You know, if she had maybe mm -hmm. has had this discussion like at a, on a conference or something like that, it would have been maybe different, but this was a way to make it like natural and in a lane that's natural to her. And I just hope that this, this can serve as a message, not only for the Dominican American children and generation here, but also in Dominican Republic, because like Angie said, like, those are two little girls. And I'm thinking like, are there right now, are there little children in Dominican Republic becoming friends with Haitian children? I don't know, I, I, I was born and raised here. So I asked myself that, um, but I thought it was genius. I thought it was such a way to push the envelope and start that conversation. I mean, really, uh, Karina, you make a really good point by saying how she weaves it in there, right? Talking about um, the hospital, that she couldn't go to the hospital to give birth. And that, I think it's a very, it's very pivotal. It's very, um, it, right? When, when Dominicans talk about Haitians invading the Dominican Republic, that's one of the first things that they talk about is the hospitals. There's too many women, there's more Haitian women going to the hospitals to give birth. So there's no, there's not enough services or not enough doctors to go around for, for Dominicans, right? Or they're taking away our services, right? They're depleting our hospitals or our schools. So um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Karina, that the hospital was definitely, you know, they were friends, but the hospital sort of like um, served that purpose to to let the reader know of what is going on in the country politically with with Haitians. Um, you also want to add something about the Dominican Haitian? Uh, yeah, it does sound. It sounds exactly like Trump. That's why when I I always mm -hmm. tell that I'll just make that one point that when people that want to talk about Haitians, I tell them use that same conversation, the same words that you're using, but place it here. And then you become the Haitian here, right? Because that's the same way that white people and Donald Trump are talking about us. So, and they're like, oh, are you saying the last person that I had that conversation with, she's like, oh, are you saying that I am a, a Trump supporter? I'm like, I didn't say that you're a Trump supporter, but your rhetoric sounds a lot like, like um, Trump and his supporters. I actually yeah. didn't read that part as like, as much of a like a political statement just because i mean i lived in the dr before and i it's very it's to me it's very realistic and very natural for there to be you know you have haitian neighbors and you have a relationship with them and you play with the kids and like it's it like we can't forget that our communities are that intermixed like we are sharing an island and i think even the fact that her um 
tia is a curandera too like that brings the sort of religious aspect of it and the, the cultural and traditional aspect of our, of our cultures that are really intermixed and i feel like it would have been just negligent to ignore that especially given like so Sosua, there, there, there's definitely a big Haitian community in Sosua. And I mean, it's kind of like, where is the line? Um, I mean, she also goes into colorism and how one of the sisters is darker. And mm-hmm. so it's, it, I, to me, it felt very natural. It felt just like coloring the book. Um, yeah. I also think it's, I want to say that I really like that she, um, I guess introduced into the book, uh, the curandera aspect. Um, Cause I know it from as like tanteria and I know that that is something that happens in like all the Caribbean. I'm Cuban and I know people that practice it. Um, I don't myself, but there's uh, like, people know it exists, but people don't want to mess with it is what everybody says. And so I really like that she put it into the book and she did it from a very positive standpoint, like she did with the Haitian and um, and you know the Dominican relationship like it is possible for it to be a good thing it's not just all bad and that's the one perspective that we usually get or at least I've seen in in other medias and and stories so I'm glad she does at things that are normally like a bad thing but are really just things (laughs) they're not either good or bad they're just there Mm -hmm. All right, guys. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's been very good for me, a, a great learning experience um, being here with you all and listening to everybody's perspectives. Um, and then uh, Angie blessing us with that little surprise there. Well, that big surprise of uh, bringing Elizabeth Acevedo on. Um, so if you guys, if anybody wants to just sound off in the chat, if you want to leave any comments there. I want to, um, Giselle, are you there? Um, could yeah. you show your face and introduce yourself? Um, Giselle Vélez from Latin <laughs> Suites. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. Where is she? I can't see her. I'm... Show yourself, Giselle. <laughs> Or you, ladies, I just want you ladies to talk about your platform. Um, and I saw in the chat that you're also going to continue the discussion. So if you could share that with the lady, with everyone here. Yeah, we're just not sure if everyone from our group chat uh, made it to the Zoom. So we will be having another discussion maybe tomorrow because it's kind of late now. But yeah, basically, we are a Latinx book club that is focused on writers of color. Uh, not only like Dominican writers or Latino writers, but also just basically from everywhere. Um, but yeah, um, we use our platform just to support and promote um, other books that are written by, um, you know, people of color. Thank you. Yeah. So how do, how do people sign up for the next discussion with you guys? So um, we just create a chat every month for the book that we're reading. Like next month, we're reading uh, Mexican Gothic. So we just put the post up and people can comment and you know say that if they want to be added. And then we just have a discussion. Sometimes we have it at the middle of the month and one at the end, sometimes just one discussion at the end of the month. But yeah, that's how we- um, and, and to continue this discussion, just follow the platform and you're going to post info of when you're going to talk about Clap When You Land. Um, if they want to join us now, they can just DM us and we will add them to the chat. There's a lot um, of space in the chat for more so people. If any of you felt like you had unanswered questions or stuff that you still had left to say, <laughs> join Mateys and Giselle on the Latins Read to um, platform, DM them and um, join. I know that Ms. Rizos and Ada are also discussing the book, so if you go through uh, um, All Things Adas or Ms. Rizzo's, um account, you should be able to sign up for their book club discussion. So a lot of people are discussing this book now. So do join, um, do join as many book discussions that you can. If you read the book, I urge you all to please go on Amazon or whatever platform you purchase the book on, go on Goodreads and please review the book. It is very... Yes. 
important for you to leave book reviews because one, that's how we find books, right? That's how other people find if a book is worthy of reading. And also, you never know who's reading those books. So you're helping the author sell more books, right? And when you help the author sell more books, publishers finally realize that our stories matter, right? So I, that, that is super important, especially for any of you who are writers on this platform. Oh, my God. La gente me tiene loca, me con estos motores. Como te poncho de Santo Domingo. If it's not the motorcycles, it's the, the, the fireworks. Fireworks, Andy. Works. Angie, I had a question. Are we going to do another book review next month? For, for Clap on You Land? No, for, in the DWA. Is there going to be another uh, book? So uh, next month's bo um, book of the month is Ghost Squad. And it's a middle grade book written by Claribel Ortega. And it's about two Dominican kids who live in the DR. It's a magical realism. So if you've never read a magical realism, Claribel is the first Dominican author to write magical realism in middle grade. Um, and that's for elementary school children, if any of you have elementary school children. So I am, I will be promoting that all this week. So, and it's currently on the website also. If you click on, on, the, on their book club, it's there and you can RSVP for it. Now is the time to go read the book. Um, I always provide discounts through WordUp. You can order online through WordUp. And if you don't see a discount in your email confirmation, hit me up through Dominican Writers because you're supposed, um, I'm supposed to include it there. Um, but you could also purchase the book wherever you're most comfortable. I know some people have, you know, are going through financial hardships. So if Amazon is the best place for you to purchase the book, by all means, go ahead and purchase it there. But we are intentional about supporting our local bookstores. So if you're located in the, in the Bronx, please order from the Lip Bar. If you're located in Manhattan, please order from Word Up Books or Sister Uptown. Um, and if you're outside of New York City, just try to find your local bookstore so that you could support them. Um, so once again, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I hope that I was able to bring you some joy during these very um, tumultuous times. Um, I know I'm always happy to see Liz and I hope that you all can now go to sleep with a bigger smile on your face. <laughs> um, because um, she joined our book club discussion. So, hasta luego. Um, any questions, always hit me up via DM on Dominican Writers and I will be happy to reply. But um, have a good night, everybody. Oh, and we recorded this, so I could share it. Um, oh. So, I'll, I'll probably add it to our YouTube channel. But um, thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you for you. setting Bye. this up and having us. I love that. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you, Mimi. You. Thank you, Giselle. Everybody who came from Mami Chula Social Club. Thank you. Thank you, Mami Chula. Bye. Bye. Bye.